Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jim Obermeyer, and I am the Vice President of Business Development and Marketing here at Vitech Corporation. I'm pleased to be your host for today's webinar as we discuss how to reduce risk and go beyond requirements. Before we get started, I'd like to take a moment to review a few technical details. First, questions. Uh, you're all systems engineers. You always have questions. Please feel free to submit your questions at any time during the Q&A function. We'll be able to see them in the go to webinar window. We will be monitoring these throughout today's events. We plan to respond to the questions at the end of the webinar, so please keep your questions coming. We'll probably not have the time to respond to all of them, but rest assured we will get back to you one on one personally to answer any questions you might have. Uh, yes, we are doing a recording today, and this webinar is recorded. If you're having technical difficulties during the presentations and online, archive of this presentation will be available within 24 hours. Uh, a few more housekeeping issues. So leverage uh, December 13th at 3 p.m. Our next webinar is Leveraging Service-Oriented Architectures with MBSE by Zane Scott. Zane has given a lot of our programs this year that have been extremely well attended, so please don't miss it on December 13th at 3 p.m. Another brief uh, comment. Uh, the Users Conference for Vitech Corporation Insight 2013 will be on April 24th to 26th, 2013. Please visit the website, www.insightconference2013.com. That's insightconference2013.com for the full details, as well as more information about the Early Bird Special for signing it up. Now to get into our program today, how to risk, how to reduce risk and go beyond requirements. Our speaker today <coughs> is Warren Smith. He's a systems engineer by trade who has worked for tool vendors and systems developers. He's been involved with defense and space and even amusement park rides and other areas. He holds a degree in electrical engineering with 25 years of experience. Warren understands the need for a practical, hands-on software solution that shows a return on investment, which measures in at 100 times ROI that range for every product project it is used upon. I think I need another glass of water, Warren. Uh, <laughs> please, join, please join me in welcoming our speaker for today, Warren Smith. <laughs> Thanks, Jim. Have a drink uh, and uh, wet that whistle. I appreciate that introduction. Um, in order to get to the meat of today's webinar, which of course is going beyond requirements, I'm going to spend about uh, 15 minutes or so on various aspects of systems engineering and discuss how this applies to requirements. So, so hang in there through this, this necessary background and you'll be able to see how you can reduce risk and, and go beyond requirements by looking at one of the first aircraft development efforts back in the early 1900s. And, and, and Warren, which aircraft development are you talking about? I'm going to be talking about uh, a Wright Brothers aircraft development uh, shortly after they got started with their, their first flight at Kitty Hawk in 1903. Now that I've got my slides to advance, um, let me keep going on this. <laughs> so uh, these are the objectives for today's webinar. Um, obviously, everyone understands that requirements are, are a critical part of systems engineering. Uh, but I wanted to develop this webinar because I've spent a lot of my systems engineering career doing various types of analysis. And engineering analysis is it's, it's a really critical and, and often overlooked step in, in the requirements derivation process. So, so today I'd like to show you how, how these types of analyses and really virtual systems prototyping fit into the system specification process. So I said I'm going to start with a little bit of background on systems engineering. Not everyone here necessarily is a systems engineer, so hopefully it, uh, it, it will be new to, to many of the folks online. Uh, we're all here to produce better systems that satisfy very real needs. And, and we're here to build systems that, that delight our users and, and provide value to our customers. Now, systems engineering has been defined in a variety of different formats. MIL standard 499 is one of, the, uh, one of the older definitions of systems engineering, and it defines it as transforming an operational need into a system, into system performance parameters and a system configuration. 
There are other definitions. Uh, EIA standard 632 defines systems engineering as, as an evolving and, and verifying, uh, verifying a set of systems or people or products or processes that, that satisfy, that work together to satisfy customer needs. So to kind of put the systems engineering activities in context, um, and before we discuss the example about the 1907 flying machine that I've prepared, I'd like to give kind of a brief overview of the systems engineer's responsibilities. Now, the systems engineers in the audience you know, already know this, but it bears repeating for the PMs and the others that maybe don't have that familiarity. So there's four key domains in systems engineering. Requirements analysis up on the upper left-hand side is, is a necessary uh, step to assess the user's needs and the customer's desires and the operational intent of the system. And in some fields, like in military development, requirements are really well, uh, really, really well defined. In other fields, though, the user needs are only vaguely understood or, or they're not very well documented. And in those cases, it falls on the systems engineer in these, uh, in, in these programs to elicit those requirements through an interactive, iterative process of behavioral and architectural analysis. And when you look in the upper right-hand corner, uh, we see a behavior model. The behavior model, that domain is a key and often, it's often an underrepresented domain of systems engineering. Often people don't do sufficient behavior modeling. And this is where the system functions are described in the behavior model, uh, what the system has to do. And they're critical in understanding all of the different behaviors, functions, interfaces, and capabilities that have to be built into the system in order for that system to, to perform, uh, perform the needs that the customers have for it. In the lower right-hand corner, the architecture describes all the various piece parts that make up the system. And systems engineers perform system architecture. And that's defining all of this, the software, the hardware, and the processes, and the other elements that collaborate together to perform the functions and behaviors that we described above. So, so this captures all of the physical parts and the interfaces of the system in the architectural domain. Okay, so, so obviously the behavior in a system is allocated or assigned to the various architectural components. And these allocations have, have very real implications on systems performance. You want to have your functions allocated in a way to optimize the systems. Uh, will the interconnections have sufficient capacity uh, does the system provide the right redundancy? And, and these kinds of questions need to be analyzed. Now, verification and validation captures the methods necessary to test the system, but VMV also includes simulations, like the one I'm, I'm showing here in the lower left-hand corner, to exercise a, a, a virtual prototype of the system, answering those what-if questions concerning the, the validity of the architecture to ensure that it adequately performs the functions that it has to do. So virtual prototyping is a key component of verification and validation. Now, As we develop these various views of the system, these various models, they, they of course have to tie together. And those relationships represent the totality of the traceability of the systems engineering effort. So, so functions are based on requirements and, and components perform various functions and of course everything has to be verified and validated. Now here at Vitech we include all these different aspects of systems engineering in a common, common shared repository and that allows all the team members to access all of these different types of systems engineering data concurrently. Now, this repository contains, as I said, each of the artifacts and all of the relationships between those artifacts. 
So, so all the requirements, all the functions and components and all the tests are included and, and also included are other things like, like use cases, states, risk, concerns, interfaces, and, and just everything that makes up the definition of a system. Now, core, the tool that I've modeled the 1907 flying machine in, actually is a window into this shared database. So in order to make the uh, next part of the presentation make sense, let me walk you through some of the, uh, some of the basics of this screen here. So by way of orientation, uh, Core provides placeholders along this left-hand side of the screen for all the different types of systems engineering artifacts. Uh, the center column, if you click on a, on a folder, the center column shows a list of all the elements that are in that folder. So right here, we're looking at a list of, of the functions, uh, the steps necessary to assemble a flying machine. Now, the right-hand side shows a diagram of those items. So just to pull all this together, remember those four domains? Well, here I've put them up on the screen and showed you where they would be implemented in the core software tool. Now, of course, systems engineers are responsible for more than just these things. They're responsible for risks, and they're responsible for interfaces, and resources, and a number of different kinds of elements. Those are also captured within, within the tool so they can be allocated and linked and worked with alongside the other technical artifacts of the system. Okay, so now that we've covered the basics of systems engineering, let's get to the topic that we're all interested in, which is going beyond requirements. So many organizations, of course, perform all four of the areas and the domains that I've discussed earlier, but you know, many do not. No, no, Warren. Do you mean they don't perform at all? At all, or do they perform it in many tools? Uh, so, are you? They don't be harmed. They don't actually track the behavior. What do you mean by many do not? Well, that's actually a really good question. Yeah, I've I've seen a number of different organizations that I've worked with through the years. Uh, some of them will, for instance, focus heavily on requirements. I'll talk about that a little bit more, and um, and sometimes focus so much on requirements that they miss out on some of the, some of the uh, behavioral analysis necessary to have a full system description. Um, other organizations I've seen do all these areas, but their, uh, their mechanism for, for capturing, say, behavior or architecture might be in Visio or PowerPoint. Uh, the issue with that is that as changes occur in one aspect or another, trying to ensure that all the different portions of the system's definition are kept in sync becomes a very, very costly part of their development effort. So, um, uh, so if I can interrupt, so, so you're saying that not having that single database uh, that ties everything together adds more time, effort, labor, and risk that something will be overlooked because everybody's using these separate systems to perform their different functions. You got it, Jim. That's exactly what, uh, that's exactly what happens in many of the organizations I've worked with in the past, yeah. Hmm. <laughs> Excuse me. Well, well let's, let's get Bless into you. our, uh, our <laughs> thank you. <laughs> let's, let's get into our example here. <coughs> Pardon me. So of course, what a fine-looking man, what a fine, <laughs> fine-looking man, Brigadier General James Allen. I'm covering for you so you can sneeze, uh, Brigadier General James Allen. Tell us about General Allen. <laughs> okay, I've gotten my drink of water now. <laughs> Thanks for that, Jim. Yeah, uh, General James Allen is an interesting guy. He uh, he was a very progressive general back in um, back in the early 1900s, turn of the last century, so over 100 years ago, and he was a general in the uh, U.S. Army Signal Corps. And one of the things that they recognized very early on with the development of uh, the Wright Brothers aircraft was that they could use they could use this technology to provide reconnaissance and surveillance on the battlefield. And 
1907, just four years after the Wright brothers' first flight at Kitty Hawk, um, General James Allen, General Allen decided to initiate a government procurement of a flying machine. Now, um, contrary to popular belief, requirements documents really have been around for a very long time. How do I know that? Well, this gentleman wrote the requirements document there on the right, spec 486. So um, he, uh, he let out a request for proposal. Uh, the Wright brothers ultimately won the effort, and they won a $25,000 contract, which was initiated by this three-page specification. So let's look at uh, Spec 486. Spec 486 included, included requirements that, that really are very similar to the ones that we see in mill specs today. Um, requirement 2 here specifies that the aircraft, which is transported in pieces on wagons to the launch site, can be assembled and ready to fly in one hour. Requirement 3. It specifies that the flying machine can carry two people. And this was a great increase in uh, payload for the aircraft. Um, remember, it flew originally with, um, with one person at Kitty Hawk. And it had to have sufficient fuel to keep the aircraft aloft for almost three hours at the astounding speed of 40 miles per hour. But imagine the engineering effort that must have been required in 1907 to, to design a plane with such uh, such a much larger uh, capacity than the current payloads at the time. Now, requirement five, it identifies a validation requirement. It specifies the the way that the measurement uh, the, the the measurement would be taken to demonstrate compliance with the speed requirements. Again, very common to the types of requirements we get today, over a hundred years later. Now, my personal favorite is this one. Requirement 10, quote, it should be sufficiently simple in its construction and operation to permit an intelligent man to become proficient in its use within a reasonable length of time, unquote. <laughs> I think most of us would like, uh, like to see requirements like this from time to time, but of course uh, the science of requirements today really demands that requirements are clear and testable, and this may be a common sense requirement, but it's, it's unfortunately neither one of those things. So, so many of the organizations that, that I work with really pride themselves on their investment in requirements. And, and to be sure, some of that investment is really quite significant. But, but as Spec 486 shows us, requirements techniques are, are over, over 100 years old, not really state of the art. So let's talk for a minute about how requirements came into their own. Now, back in the 60s, while while requirements were not often emphasized, they were identified as, as a key systems engineering discipline. This, this long, dry passage, which, which I'm not going to read to you today, was taken from the Systems Engineering Management Standard, that 499 that I mentioned earlier, and it was published by the Air Force well within days of the lunar landing of 1969, and it clearly shows uh, that systems requirements are a key domain of systems engineering. Uh, 19 uh, 83, the Defense Systems Management College published the Systems Engineering Management Guide, and it identified systems engineering procedures and methods, and, and requirements were among them, but analysis and architectural methods were key, too. Uh, structure analysis and the schler millor some of you graybeards might remember those, and, and other techniques beyond requirements were, were developed and tools were promoted uh, to, to implement those back in the 80s and early 90s. Now, as systems became increasingly complex and uh, more complicated electronic controls and, and complex Byzantine software were implemented in the systems, systems failures started to increase. Anyone remember the Sergeant York? But while the number of systems factors that, that were responsible was beyond just requirements. The ushering of the 1990s found that the requirements banner was really picked up by a number of organizations. And, and a lack of requirements and requirements creep and poorly managed requirements were all trumpeted 
really throughout the industry and, and broadly identified as, as the driving forces behind those recent development failures. So along comes the 1990s, and now we have a flood of methodologists that are really steeped in these systems, and they appeared on the scene really proclaiming requirements to be the solution. And, and to be sure, poor requirements defini definition did abound and really uh, contributed, but it wasn't the only factor, and, and it is high time and was high time to, to correct that omission. So some folks like, uh, like Carl Wiegers and Ivor Jakobsen, uh, the inventor of the use case, appeared on the scene. Uh, they spread the gospel of requirements and, and used the user's perspective, and with them they brought the tools to, to capture and to document and to, and to trace the textual wonders that requirements were becoming. I was around back then, and, and as I recollect it, uh, requirements, they, they really did kind of take on an almost mystical importance in development organization in the 90s. Um, each sentence of text was to be isolated and studied and, and pondered, and specialized tools proliferated to, to capture and, and manage and trace each one of those. And along with, uh, along with the tools sprung organizations to own and to operate those tools. And with these organizations came budgets to manage and, and budgets to protect. But as we all know, requirements management does not equal systems engineering. And a funny thing happened on the way to the requirements party. Somehow the rest of systems engineering almost seemed to be forgotten. Now you see, systems engineers are responsible for balancing systems performance and the functions and the architecture and the configuration. And they're responsible for defining the set of people and products and processes that need to collaborate together to, to satisfy their customers' needs. And requirements are, by their nature, textual. Um, not everything can be represented by text. And while text is really good and it's really important, it really can't alone describe functions and behavior and allocated architecture and all the VNV and all those things that we talked about together. The other work, other work is required for that. So, so now the title, Systems Engineers, which, which really confers on it, in my mind, all the depth of expertise and the knowledge associated with understanding the whole system and providing that synthesis and balance to the system and how it works in a totality with its components and functions and how it's tested. Um, is really what we're looking at. And in my mind, the sure sign that requirements had kind of overbalanced the scale and maybe cast too long of a shadow was when organizations, some of them, started to drop the title systems engineer and start calling their people requirements engineers. Now, are requirements engineers sharp? <laughs> you bet they are. They're very sharp. But they're primarily, uh, they're primarily the result of a budget and a tool, and we need to get back to the complete systems analysis piece and the interdisciplinary approach that encompasses the entire technical effort that systems engineers provide and requirements engineering is a subdomain of. Yeah. One, one key, yeah, go ahead. Uh, one, one comment, uh, a, a, a consultant I knew many years ago said, any good trait taken to an extreme can become a negative. Uh, and does this fall into that category? Uh, once we saw requirements, everybody said, "Oh, the requirements is is the uh, it's it's the golden rule here for us." But if you take it all the way out and, and you rely on it to do everything for you, you're you're bound to fail in other areas. And yet, it's essential. So you're just talking about people who take it to an extreme, and that's where it becomes a negative. Is that right? I, I would agree with that. Yeah, absolutely. Requirements are they're a critical portion of systems engineering. All the uh, all the documents that I've shown in this uh, presentation so far identify them as a really important factor. But you're right. I, I have seen organizations that really have focused their their time and their efforts and their money in requirements to the exclusion of those other three domains in systems engineering. And and it's it's unfortunate because. Uh, Looking at textual requirements alone cannot get you to a system. 
In fact, one of the key areas that systems engineers need to, to manage is risk. And risk involves lots of different areas. It involves uh, uh, the behavior and the allocation, managing resources, doing adequate uh, uh, prototyping and testing. And one of the, the title of this presentation is, um, is managing risk and going beyond requirements. They really are tied together. Now, most program managers, I think, have a pretty good idea of the risk associated with their programs, often early on. Uh, risks, risks are usually managed outside of any technical work products. Uh, there's probably some PMs in the audience here, and I wonder how many of you have managed risks in a spreadsheet, or, or maybe even managed them in a PowerPoint presentation with stoplight colors, and, and really they only come out during program reviews. Um, or maybe they're they're handled, but uh, but they're not managing those risks is is done in a more lightweight manner on the program. Now I think that a better way to do this is to include your risks directly in your technical model. Here we see a description of the risk. It's written in the model. Quote: To uh, to more than double the payload requires a significant increase in risk. You can see that in that kind of uh, rectangular um, box in the upper right-hand corner. And we can see right below it that, uh, that this risk is open, that it's unmitigated. Including risk descriptions, along with the technical analysis, uh, provides the ability to provide status and allows for very, very straightforward reporting. OK. So imagine, just imagine for a minute having, having all your risks and your issues entered right in the architectural model and linked directly to the elements and the functions that are necessary to mitigate those risks. In this case, you can see that the risk, which is listed on, on in kind of in that center there, um, and its mitigation is linked through that cause by relationship directly to the wing subsystem of the flying machine that we're about to assess. So using this technique, one can identify the risk, make the relationship to the analysis that needs to be done, even if that analysis will be done in the future. It doesn't get lost that way. So Looking at this, another advantage hopefully will become clear. Many organizations struggle with requirements in one tool and risks in another tool. A third tool will capture verification and validation methods. A fourth tool might be used for analysis. And when it comes to documentation, that's often managed in Word. <laughs> A fifth tool. So, so the cost of managing changes as they affect all these different tools really becomes a major and often hidden cost on projects. It's what we were talking about a minute earlier, Jim. And sadly, so do you mean? Uh, but but do you, so the cost you're saying is the different software products, the maintenance of those products, the, not only buying them but maintaining them, uh, the cost of the labor because none of these are tied together, the cost of the updates, the cost, and, and then the risk that something is. OK. I just lost audio from you, Jim. So I'm going to it's okay. chat. You're, you're, you're live. Go ahead. OK. Uh, yeah, good, you're good. live. I've just got a, a, I just put my comment in there about risk. OK. So um, I'm going to uh, continue presenting here. And uh, I think that uh, Jim, for me, just dropped out. So if, uh, if you can't hear me, please send me a chat, Bethany. Um, yeah, well, your point is well taken. And really, the, the major cost is the cost of the engineering labor necessary to keep all of those four or five tools working together. So if something changes in the, in the architecture, say uh, an expected component can't be developed, they have to do something different, reallocate, that will affect functions and requirements. Requirements change. All these things change. And keeping 
that data synced up between different tools is very cost uh, is very expensive. It's very costly, and um, it in itself adds risk to your development effort. So, if you contrast that with a model-based systems engineering approach, which is kind of what I'm showing here, with all of the elements of the systems uh, activity all included in a single shared repository, then the changes immediately propagate to each diagram and each document and the artifacts that uh, that make up the system. Okay, <clears throat> so let's uh, let's move forward to an actual analysis. In 1907, um, really, uh, someone who developing an aircraft that had all the requirements that we've identified was really very challenging. Um, requirement three really called for about a doubling of the payload of the aircraft, and, and this necessitated really dramatic engineering efforts to accomplish this feat. And the total weight of the machine plus uh, plus the payload would be in excess of 750 pounds. So, so figuring out what the requirements are on, say, the wing subsystem was not the job of a requirements engineer. It was the job of a systems engineer with a, a broad systems perspective and a willingness to perform what-if architectural analysis. So um, if one was to write a subsystem or a component requirement, then you'd have to have a physical architecture to hang that on. So what factors affected the physical architecture of the 1907 flying machine? Well, it had to carry two people. So from an architecture perspective, how should they be situated? Side by side, front to rear? Um, should they be lying down like the, like the first flyer? There are other factors too, of course. Um, the doubling of the payload um, really impacted a number of things. And each of these architectures, they need to be analyzed before subsystem requirements can be written. So if you'll notice, we've, we've quickly went beyond the realm of, of requirements engineering and moved into the realm of architecture. And with the addition of this added weight and the extra person and so forth, and the fuel necessary to keep the aircraft aloft for three hours and the larger engine, the lift capacity is going to be more than twice the, the current designs at the time. So a key architectural factor, physical architecture, is, is literally the number of wings and the lift that each wing would have. In fact, you know, I'd say that this represents an area of of really significant technical risk. So, so let's talk about uh, that risk and 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 see how we can how it can be addressed on equal footing with other technical factors. So, to kind of contrast this with a traditional requirements approach, a re traditional requirements approach would take that spec 486 and identify the system requirements and identify the the system shall do this or that or the other. And then somehow a miracle occurs and you identify a set of wing requirements or other subsystem requirements that do this or that or the other thing. Let's examine what's inside that, uh, that miracle. We need to assess whether or not a biplane, uh, the, the system's going to be a biplane or a triplane. Okay. And of course, the architecture is going to be affected by a range of requirements. For instance, requirement two, if you recall, said that the flying machine had to be assembled in about an hour with parts carried, <laughs> carried to, the, uh, to the runway on wagons. This is a very physical task, and, and it, it could easily constrain our architecture. So, so this assessment is going beyond requirements and is going to... Uh, to entail a very familiar diagram to, to many people, an activity diagram. So let's take a look at how this plane is going to be assembled. Um, we'll use the activity diagram from the core model to assess this. The first steps are going to be transportation, and uh, the various pieces of the flying machine are loaded onto wagons and transported to the staging area. So if you'll notice that core uses standard system L notation, uh, 
to represent these interconnected blocks. And various SysML structures are available along the left side that can be dragged and dropped into the model. But that's not all you can show on a core MBSC activity diagram. Often activity or, or other diagrams are presented to end users or customers. And in 1907, like in 1912, I bet that General Allen would have appreciated a more understandable description of the assembly steps. So Core supports that. You can incorporate uh, artwork and pictures and so forth into your models for presentation to other maybe less technically oriented uh, stakeholders. So here I've included the garotype photograph from around 1907. It shows, it shows the wagon train moving the flying machine parts to the staging area. Okay? Now, you can also uh, capture other types of information. Um, for instance, uh, I do a lot of my work uh, at whiteboards, a lot of my thinking. Uh, I might get a group together and we might think through the assembly steps like I show here. Um, you can whiteboard things out and, and you can take pictures of them with your, uh, with your phone and, and incorporate those uh, into the model. Now, this is uh, the pilot cage, the, the seats side by side. Uh, I'm really, <laughs> I'm a really bad artist. Um, and I'd like to apologize for the Wright brothers for my really sad sketches, but, um, but there you go. You can incorporate whiteboard and other type of information into into your activity diagram. Now this shows a SysML structure. Uh, on the right you can see that we've got a parallel structure where, where wheels and control levers are attached to the main frame concurrently. So these are the steps necessary to assemble the flying machine before it can take off. In the little yellow box you can see that, uh, that time equals zero there, meaning that's when we're going to start our 60-minute uh, assessment. As we progress through, we're going to do an analysis of the number of wings that the aircraft might have. Remember, the question is, do we have an architecture with two wings or do we have an architecture with three wings? So this shows a, uh, an iteration. Let's, let's examine the assembly of the wings onto the aircraft. So we've used a SysML iteration structure here to model attaching the wings to the frame. So each wing attaches to the aircraft using struts. And each wing takes about the same amount of time to attach. So now that lucky, that lucky intelligent man that uh, they mentioned who's assigned to assemble the flying machine, he will take a certain amount of time to perform each step to assemble this aircraft. So we're going to start by looking at the three wing triplane architecture. Okay? So the first architecture will have the assembler installing three wings. Now once we know how many wings we're going to install, we need to define how long it will take to install each wing. In fact, we have to assign times for every step in the activity diagram. So we can assign an estimated time to, f to perform every one of those steps. And we do that by simply defining a duration to each of those activities on the diagram. And I've circled one here. Now I've assigned time durations to each of those steps in the model. And the wheels, the wheels can be attached in six minutes and and uh, so forth. Um, on, the, on the right, you can see it takes 10 minutes to attach each wing. That's our best guess of how long it will take to assemble the wings onto the aircraft. Now, now as anyone who's ever, who's ever worked on a car or really assembled anything at all, even a piece of furniture at home, knows that uh, these kinds of numbers are not an exact science. So to support this, CORE supports the bell-shaped curves and, and other distributions for functions. So for instance, here you can see on the left that installing the engine we think will take a nominal eight minutes, but we've defined it with a normal distribution to account for the uncertainty of lugging around this heavy piece of equipment, getting it situated. 
So I hope that makes sense because one of the truly unique requirements, uh, features rather, of, of Core is its one button simulation. So with absolutely no annotations whatsoever, with just laying functions out into the model, you can simulate any activity model or, or any functional behavior model from the get-go. So, so as I've mentioned before, I've added the durations for each activity because remember, we have a 60-minute assembly time, but Core has the easiest simulation capabilities I've ever seen. So by clicking that Run button at the top, it runs the simulation. So you can see that the simulation of how long it takes to assemble this flying machine starts where time equals zero because remember it starts after we've unloaded the wagons. And each one of those uh, items, uh, 1.4, 1.5, etc. on the left, represent one of those activities in the activity model and the time duration necessary to perform that. So let's take a quick look at the, at the wings. Note that the, the iteration function shows that each of the shows each of the wings uh, being attached, okay, one at a time using those struts. And the three teal boxes in a row simulate the wing installation. So the first teal box is assembling the first wing, the second box represents the second, and the third box represents assembling the third wing with the struts. And remember it takes about ten minutes to assemble each wing. So when we look at that, and we run this simulation, we see that this analysis shows that it's going to take about 70 minutes to assemble a three-winged flying machine. Okay, so 70 minutes. Let, let's, uh, let's rerun the simulation and uh, see what it looks like if we designed a biplane, if we had a two-wing architecture instead of a three-wing architecture. So here I've uh, replaced the number of wings, the number of times the step will be run from three to two, one for each wing. Now we can see that installing the two wings brings us close to the 60-minute requirement, which, in fact, uh, can be met, 59.77 <laughs> minutes. Okay, so let's talk about that for a second. Yes, it meets the 60-minute requirement with two wings, but but do you think that this plane will always be assembled in 59.77 minutes? Uh, no, no, of course not. Um, you know, the weather and how well trained that intelligent man is and a and hundred other fact, factors are going to affect the assembly time. Now, what's, what's cool is that Core can handle these real-world variations. If we rerun this simulation multiple times, we can see that the timing will reflect the probabilistic distributions that we set up for those durations. So whether it's a, a normal distribution or exponential or a Poisson or a triangular or any one of, a tw of 20, we have 20 different options, Core produces realistic analyses for the system. In fact, just this month, the space mission passed its PDR. With flying colors, I might add. And this mission is planning to launch a spacecraft, fly to an asteroid, land on that asteroid, gather a sample of the asteroid's surface, and return it to Earth for analysis. Now, this mission, which, which really is rich with uncertainty and risk, and, and it goes from launch through landing to return, it's being modeled in core. And this, pro this realistic, probabilistic uh, analyses are being done, and it really does greatly reduce system development risk. So now that we've done uh, some heavy lifting engineering analysis, we can close out the questions that we set out to answer. Our architecture has been finalized. The solution satisfying all the requirements, it rejects it rejects the triplane. The biplane is the way to go. So now that that work has been done, now we can write our requirements based on the analysis. The flying machine shall have two wings. That's a architectural requirement. Each wing shall provide 375 pounds of lift 
at 36 miles per hour, which is the minimum speed in the spec. So the functional requirement on the wings themselves, the, that piece of the architecture, can now be derived from the analysis. We've gone beyond the requirements to perform the analysis necessary to fully specify the system. And the subsystem requirements followed the architecture. The requirements followed the architecture. They were derived from and subsequent to the analysis. So, so by going beyond these requirements, we really have ensured a more robust design. And here's, a, here's the key about the, the traceability. I mentioned traceability at the very beginning. Now that we've determined, see, our, our architectural-based requirements, we can add them to the model. And traceability shows us the impact of these derived requirements, not just on other requirements, but also on those activities. In fact, we can completely trace each of the requirements, both the source and the derived through analysis requirements, all the way down to the functions and to those components at the bottom. And in fact, we can even include risk. We could have shown that risk in there, <laughs> the test methods, um, and actually any other elements in the model. So unlike 100 years ago, what makes modern systems development unique is its ability to weave together this tapestry containing containing the requirements, absolutely, just like we've said, but, but also containing the, the behavioral and the architectural, the architectures, the physical architectures, the simulations, the what-if analyses, the virtual prototypes, which is what we did here today. We virtually prototyped a two or three wing design. We can weave together the verification and validation approaches and the risks and the concerns and the documentation. And we can keep that all in a common shared repository. Modern model-based systems engineering, it can, it can get you to the sky. And it can get you to space. It can get you to wherever you want to go. So of course, requirements are critical. They are important in every effort. General Allen knew that over 100 years ago when he wrote Spec 486. But today, today, isn't it time you went beyond requirements? Thank you very much, Warren. That was a great presentation. I, I really enjoyed uh, looking at it. Uh, now let's uh, move to the questions for our presenter. We, we've had some great questions so far. We've got eight or ten up here. And if we can't get to all of them today, we certainly will answer you directly. One of the questions is, how are changes to the repository propagated to the users? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, yeah, the repository actually is a, uh, a shared repository that, that holds all the model elements. So, for instance, if you have, uh, uh, let's say you have two or three people or, or two dozen people working in the, in the system, and they have different views, diagrams, or property sheets open uh, looking at different pieces. If one person changes something in the model, let's say they, something simple, let's say they correct a uh, spelling mistake in, uh, in a component name. If I do that, Jim, and you have it open, uh, a diagram open on your screen that has that component uh, on the diagram, as soon as I make that change, that change will go into the repository. The repository will update the model, and then your screen will be uh, updated to reflect the new spelling. So it instantly propagates changes as they're made to all members of the development team. Okay. Uh, we've got four or five more questions before we announce the winner of the um, mini iPad uh, at the end of the program. And I've got a question here from uh, Sarah. Is there a way of tracking which risks have been addressed and which have not? Uh, yes, in fact, there are. You can, you can filter information in core based upon any of those uh, factors or attributes associated with it. And on that chart, Sarah, where you saw the risk, uh, you saw that there was an area that showed 
open or unmitigated requirements. And you would have other other values in that uh, field. You'd have ones that were closed or ones that were being uh, addressed or inactive. And you can actually generate um, filtered lists that show just the open ones, which is the ones you asked about, and then those can be exported and given to members of the project team. Okay. What version of core were you demonstrating in this presentation? Stephanie wanted to know. Uh, yes, Stephanie. I, I'm, I'm using core 8. That's the most recent version of core. Mm -hmm. uh, James asked, how is the model configuration managed? Oh, uh, that's a good question. Um, the way Core works, since it's really a, a uh, team development tool, we have two elements that are used to manage the model configuration. Uh, one is that we have history of changes that are kept, that's kept in the, in the repository, in the database, as various elements are changed. So people are doing their work, and those changes that they make are tracked in what we call an audit log. Now, Primarily, the way we recommend it being used on a development team is when you get to a certain milestone on the program. It could be a review, you know, maybe your system requires review and your preliminary design review and your critical design review, whatever it might be, or it could just be because you baseline on a regular basis. Um, you make a snapshot of the, uh, of the repository at that point, and then you can use that as a rollback. Uh, point if you need to in the future. Okay. Uh, let's see. From uh, Mike. Mike asks, can you generate a risk watch list? Um, a risk watch list. Uh, actually, just before I answer that uh, for Mike, uh, let me also comment that, um, that on the last question, Core does make an automatic backup uh, on a regular basis, which you can set, and it's defaulted for once a week as well. If you're running the core server, uh, so that's another uh, that's another aspect of that. Cool. So, yeah, that's a neat one. So, a risk watch list. Um, I'm I'm envisioning what he means by that, since uh, since he just was able to type in his question. I think that he's probably talking about um, uh, being able to maybe identify and report on risks that are of certain interest to certain people. Um, assuming that that's the case, uh, was it Tom, Jim, that asked uh, that? No, it was Mike. Mike, okay. If that's what you're asking about, Mike, um, yeah, what we can do is with, within the tool, identify, um, identify elements within the tool that specific individuals or groups of individuals like a program manager group or an engineer group um, identify specific risks or any other elements that they're interested in and then uh, craft specific um, outputs that they would use to track their set of, of risks in that case. And if that's not what you're looking for then uh, contact us afterwards and we'll talk some more about the specifics of your question. Okay, and uh, we probably should just uh, uh, have another uh, one more question, and then then we'll uh, we've got another eight or ten here. Geez, they keep coming in. Uh, let me. <laughs> can you spawn a new requirement from a risk? Can you spawn um, a new requirement from a risk? Michael is asking this. Uh, that's a great question. Um, you know, before I answer the question, the answer the the answer to the question is yes, you can. Um, you can spawn a new requirement from the risk. Um, and in fact, mitigating risks may involve adding additional behavior or functions which, which have requirements as their basis um, as well. So that's a great question, but let me dwell on that for a second because um, let me tell a short story. I know we're running low on time, but you know, I heard once that if you went up to Alaska and you spoke with the uh, Inuit Eskimos up there, that they would have something like 57 different words to describe snow. And the reason for that is that, you know, they have a lot of different types of snow up there. They have soft powdery snow and they have, they have snow that's crusty on the top and soft underneath. And if you walk on it, you'll fall into the soft, fall through that crust and into the soft snow and die. It's important that they have a rich, a rich set of words to describe that part of their environment. Systems engineering is no different. 
there's not just one type of relationship or association or link. We have lots of different types of relationships. We have relationships that define that functions are the bases of requirements and that, that functions can be allocated to uh, architecture and components. And, and one of the things that I've really come to appreciate about CORE is that like the many descriptions of snow to the Eskimos, CORE has uh, unique definitions of relationship types. And so when someone says, well, is that hooked up? Well, there may be three or four different ways of or relationships between two elements in a system. And we can say with, with uh, certainty, well, yes, it actually is. It is hooked up as interfaces and the data messages are there and the type of communications path is defined because we have what's called a systems definition language that clearly delineates all the different types of relationships within a model. So, so that's a great question. And if you want to have a, a specific relationship, maybe risk to requirements isn't a, a, the best example for, for what you might define as a new relationship. But still, uh, you can do that inside of core. And you can ensure complete, complete understanding of all the different technical aspects of your system. Great. Well, we're, we're pushing over 60 minutes. And Jerry and James, Sarah, Denny, uh, Danny, Stephen, Chris, Alvarez, Stephen, uh, Hancock, Danny, James, uh, Stephanie, Alvarez, Michael, Ming, Henry, Stephen. Thank you very much for your questions. Oops, Stephen came in again. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, now we're going to uh, very quickly, uh, this wraps it up for today, but. Uh, uh, let's see now. Do, uh, what do we do? Do we have one more thing we have to do? Oh yes, the mini pad giveaway. Bethany, have you? Have you Bethany has done this totally independently. Do, can you? Do you have the name of the person for the mini pad giveaway? I sure do, and I'm really tickled to say that he is still on the webinar, so he's going to hear um, me announce that James Slupsky has won the iPad Mini. Uh, so James will be uh, reaching out to you. We have the email address to use to register, so I'll send you an email, and we'll confirm a shipping address for you. Thank you very much, Bethany. Congratulations. In closing, I want, uh, closing, I want to thank everyone uh, for attending today and our presenter, uh, Warren, you've really done a great job, and I learn every time I listen to you. I, I especially like to thank all of you for listening as we as we uh, wind up this this fall uh, webinar series in the next couple of weeks. Uh, don't forget that we've got uh, we've got a couple. Of, we've got one more presentation that's going to be coming up December thirteenth uh, by Zane Scott, and we also have the Insight two thousand thirteen uh, Users Conference the end of April. Please, everybody, don't hesitate to sign up. We can only have 200 people at our users conference this year. Uh, right, Bethany? And uh, I just, uh, Laura just hiccuped when I said 200, but I know we can fit 200 in if they want to come. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, everyone, uh, for, for coming in today. We will get back to everyone else and your questions in, a, in the next day or so. Warren will probably answer all of them personally. And uh, thank you, Warren, for a great presentation. It's wonderful to see a little history and a little, uh, a little systems engineering history and the requirements. And we appreciate everybody for attending our program today on how we get beyond, beyond just requirements and manage Thank you, risk. Jim. Thank, thank you, Thank you, Jim. everyone.